My name is Mike Wokash. I am an attorney. I am a game designer. I'm a dad. Uh, and I'm here to talk about fan-made games. That's my lovely daughter um, from just a couple days ago. So just real quick before we get into this, this is kind of intellectual property law 101. I'm going to rush through a bunch of stuff in about an hour. Um, we're going to talk about what I'm, I think about when I'm thinking about fan-made games what you should be thinking about if you're thinking about a fan-made game, and why we have to be thinking about them at all, which is mostly intellectual property issues. Um, so it probably start, helps to start with, when I thought of this idea, um, JT, I pitched it to JT, I was thinking about all of the people who go to the Game Crafter wanting to make their game about the thing that they're excited about, whether it's Pokemon, or Star Wars, or Indiana Jones, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and this is just a flavor of what's been going on for basically the entire time we've had a copyright system, which is people are excited about a book, a movie, uh, some piece of work, and they want to make it their own. They want to do something else. So um, I just started with a Wikipedia definition of what fan fiction was, and I was like, OK, that's close. It's a fictional writing written by an amateur in a capacity that's unauthorized by the original creators. Um, so when I was thinking about what a fan-made game is, I was like, all right, well, it's basically the same thing, except you're taking somebody else's work and you're transforming it into a medium that it wasn't designed for. It's taking Star Wars and making a board game or a card game. It's taking Pokemon and changing it around and doing it your own thing with it. You're taking somebody else's intellectual property, or their creative work, and doing something special with it. Um, there are lots and lots of examples of this. I am familiar with it. I actually have two examples of attempting fan-made works, and they've resulted in vastly different outcomes. So on the one hand, I made, with my son at the time, a uh, uh, special character for another board game called Vast, and we made up a character to play within the, the Vast realm. It was well-received by the publisher, by the artist. The artist actually took my fan-made work, created a crystal golem for me, and we you know, sort of made this player board uh, from it. They were very, very supportive. The other side was working with an artist. We didn't like the skulls and monsters of the original The Game, um, and she had created uh, a sort of a beautiful, colorful array of numbered cards. This drew the opposite reaction um, from the original publisher uh, when they found out that we had uh, created a set of cards that you could use to play the game. <laughs> so we took it down. I'll come back to that, this comment in a second, but to give you an idea, like I'm both familiar with the creative, supportive part of the community, and then the uh, other side that's like, yeah, maybe you shouldn't have done that. And we'll talk about why. I said that there's lots of examples of this. And even on the Game Crafter, you can find lots of examples of uh, you know, fan-made expansions or uh, uh, additions to <laughs> games like Risk or Scythe or um, you know, Gloomhaven. There's plenty of examples of it. Some of them are you know, supported by the manufacturers. I actually had the opportunity to play at Gamehole Con this last, uh, this last year the unofficial expansion to Gloomhaven, which was fan created. It was supported by a commercial Kickstarter. The publisher had almost nothing to do with it. They implemented it themselves, did all their own art, released an actual fully functioning game. It's fantastic if you guys have an opportunity to do it. On the far left is JT's uh, example of a Stargate board game for which uh, I think he commented in a Facebook post that I haven't yet gotten the rights to it, but he went ahead and started down this path of designing a Stargate uh, board game. So, JT, is he out there? It's not. Uh, yes, you're far right. Um, but he doesn't have the rights yet. He went ahead and designed the game anyway. I'm calling the shots. Yep, <laughs> absolutely should. I don't know who owns it, Warner Brothers? Maybe, or something. No. Anyway. So, but there's a whole bunch of examples of the sorts of things that you can do. I sort of put them into three different categories. There's reskinning of a game, 
there's expanding in a game, <clears throat> and then there's just creating a whole new design. It's just taking uh, an IP, an intellectual property, something, uh, a movie, book, uh, comic, and just creating a game out of nothing. Um, all three of these, depending on what you can do, fit in, uh, will sort of trigger different intellectual property regimes, but the way I'm thinking about it, you've got reskinning, which is you're basically, you're making your own, let's say, katan. You're coming up with your own rules, you're applying uh, maybe uh, an intellectual property like Game of Thrones or something to it, or Monop you're making a Monopoly version of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I don't know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Yahtzee for tax lawyers, something. Um, but you're just taking an existing design, you're throwing something else together because that's what you wanna do. Um, there's the expansion, which is you like a game so much or you like a universe so much, you wanna do something more with it. And good examples of this are uh, people who develop uh, Dungeons & Dragons 5e campaigns. They're, they're making their own things. Sometimes they're permissioned, sometimes they're sanctioned. They don't have to be, uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, component upgrades is another good example if, uh, if you've ever seen the people who released the luxified versions of games, things like that. They might not necessarily be uh, licensed or uh, uh, approved by the manufacturers, the designers. Uh, and then the other one is, this is Pokemon drinking game or you know, Teletubby deck building, something, you're building something new that doesn't exist currently. So the question is like why, and I'm gonna apologize because I came up with a whole bunch of terrible puns and um, there's a bunch of reasons why people will do it. Uh, they don't have, uh, <laughs> all right, that's fine, just read the. Do you, do you have the right to use I do not. That's a good question. That's like, uh, um, this was actually a photo from the Star Wars uh, in Disney World. Yeah. Um, but, in, <laughs> but in any case, there's lots of reasons people will do it. Mostly it's because they're excited about it, uh, uh, a universe, they're excited about intellectual property. Uh, you know, I made the Crystal Golem. Uh, expansion because I liked the game so much and we had to create our own creative idea of how to implement another character. Uh, there's a whole communities who work on making solo modes for vi uh, board games. You heard some solo modes design stuff earlier. Um, Were you excited That's true. I was telling people earlier they had to come to this session. Oh, well, <laughs> you don't have to. Um, I did. So there's lots of reasons why, and so fans will do this for their own reasons. There are lots of reasons why a lot of publishers, designers, authors, movie producers, uh, artists are good with it too, and I'm, this is pretty light on the screen. For them, there's incentive, right? Like they have a very excited fan base who is you know, essentially promoting their intellectual property. They're doing something for the community. It's often free and they're not charging anybody anything for it. Uh, these are often the most dedicated and vocal members of a community. Like what better way to get the word out about, you know, uh, a smaller intellectual property or creative universe than to have somebody build a game on it and show it to the whole world. Um, not every publisher is exactly the same way, uh, but for the, for the publishers, they often don't have a choice. Suing your customers is bad. I mean, you don't really wanna go after the most vocal part of your community. Sending cease and desist letters isn't great. Um, there's no guarantee that they'll win, and we'll talk about why there might be chances that they wouldn't win. Um, it's also they don't always have control over what the content is. You can imagine the not safe for work sorts of things that you could end up with, and you might not want that. And there's also the problem that what happens if a fan creates something in a space that you're already looking at moving into? So you've created a board game for an intellectual property that they had just licensed to a publisher or manufacturer to do, them, do themselves. So, um, it is okay sometimes. <clears throat> and I mentioned earlier that I was gonna come back to the, uh, the Pandasaurus comment about uh, the, the, the reskin of the game. I am not gonna get into the moral questions about whether you know, reskinning a game or plagiarizing a, a design or uh, you know, making those sorts of non-legal judgments um, matter, right? So there, there's tons of them, right? Like you, there are creative people in the world, they don't always like their stuff taken. That is a strictly moral speaking, morally speaking, not something I'm gonna cover here. I'm also not really talking about plagiarism, which is literally taking 
and not crediting and not sourcing and not um, attributing and trying to pass off as your own a, a game design. And there's plenty of those disputes that are out there as well. Uh, and I'm not gonna get into, uh, especially during the pandemic, the knockoff or the counterfeiting set of regimes where somebody took a game, basically copied all the graphic design, selling it for cheap on Amazon, that sort of thing. I'm not gonna get into that because that's not helpful for um, most game designers or the reason that we're here. Um, so I promised Tavis and the Game Crafter that I would give one cheat sheet for, to them to use during conversations with designers about what is and is not okay at a very high level and what they can safely say they can do and can't do. And so this is my cheat sheet. If you have one thing that you take away from this, it's gonna be the next slide. Um, and I've, I've put this as what you can safely do and what you cannot safely do. It does not mean that you can't do one thing or the other, but if you wanted to be like strictly within the bounds of, okay, I can get the game crafter to print my game and do this stuff, then we're talking about the things that you can safely do. One gigantic caveat here about the game crafter and other commercial printing activities is that in my category of you can safely do non-commercial activities. So if you wanted to print it off at your own little personal printer as a print and play, that's fine. If you're gonna print a game that you took the intellectual property from somebody else at a place like the Game Crafter, or even if you take it to Bob's Copy Shop or something like that, if they're on the up and up, they're probably not gonna print it because they are making money. That is a commercial activity. Yes, uh, exactly. So I'll quickly go through it. Like, you can safely do what you have permission to do. And we'll talk about permission at length in a little bit here. You can imagine, you can create, you can do a whole bunch of non-commercial designing, preparation. You know, you can create a sales pitch. You could even go back to the folks who own the Stargate uh, intellectual property with. You could do a whole lot. You can take existing themes and genres and locations and stuff that are part of universes but aren't part of the copyrighted works. You can expand on those general themes. There's nothing in the, in the intellectual property world that says you can't take a planet and use that planet and its characteristics. You can use mechanics and ideas and design concepts. There's nothing that protects those. Footnote on patents, but that's last year's presentation. Um, and then commonplace themes, locations, you know, murder mysteries, that sort of stuff. You, you can use all of those things. You can take them even from uh, great works of fiction or from movies. That there's nothing that stops you from doing that. Where you start to run into trouble is if you start to use primary characters, if you start to use the images, imagery, knockoffs of the images and imagery, uh, if you start to take the actual words and content from those intellectual property things, then you're gonna start to run into problems. And we'll talk about fair use and all of that, but this is your one slide. If you wanna like sort of good idea of what you can and cannot do safely, if you can fall within these categories of the you can do, it's probably, you're probably in the, the right place. So let's talk about permission, which is the big green one. By far, the easiest and best possible way to create your fan-created work is to have permission. Do you need it? Maybe not, we'll talk about the maybe not here in a second, but you probably do, and it's probably easier, and it probably lets you do more than you could do if you didn't ask permission in the first place, including things like print at the Game Crafter. <laughs> so, there's a whole bunch of kinds of permission. Um, we can talk about the, we'll, we'll talk about all these categories and I've sort of layered them in the, the order of what's likely to get you the best result to the, the ones that are gonna get you some, uh, uh, some rights but not a lot. So let's talk about express licenses. Lots of intellectual property, lots of universes, campaigns. I'll, I'll pick on uh, role player for a second because I am intimately familiar with this role player license. I may have had it. <laughs> may have been involved in writing it. Um, lots of companies now recognize that people wanna be able to develop games, expansions, create within the universe, and they give players and creators and designers express permission to do it. So the role player adventure license basically says, you can use our assets and our designs and all of this stuff to create a, a role player adventure. Like Keith was 
on board with that, and that's exactly what he did. There are other ones, Zeman and Games, I found, they have a community license that says the same thing. The really important part here, though, is if you see a specific license from a manufacturer, from a designer, uh, you're, you just need to ask the questions. What are the things that it's actually permitting you to do? What does the license say? And sometimes that they helpfully lay it out up top with the big bullet points and in bold print. Uh, it also is important to understand <clears throat> what it gives you the rights to. Can you use the card templates? Can you use the original art? Can you use other elements of the games? Um, what uh, Role Player Adventures license did, they, they basically packaged up a whole design kit and said anything in this kit, you can use that as part of your, um, your Role Player Adventure. They let you design cards. I can show you my Role Player Adventure card designer if you want to see the based on that license. Um, other things, whether it requires attribution. So like, can you just take a Role Player Adventure, call it your own? Eh, probably not. Um, there, are other, there are other examples of this that are out there. I pulled but I'll call community license or public style licenses. These are intended, they're kind of, they're intended like Creative Commons licenses to be used and applied to a lot of different things. Um, I pulled this one um, out of the, uh, the public license for, um, D, yeah, for 5e. <laughs> and if you look at it really carefully, the, the types of things that you get licenses for Probably not what you're thinking about necessarily at first. You don't have rights to a lot of the things, but what you do get rights to is to use the methods, procedures, processes, a lot of things that are necessary for 5e, but they're not the cool graphic art, design, templates, things like that that you might expect. Um, so you just need to be careful about, again, what these licenses um, entail. <laughs> and then, the other path to getting permission is just to ask. Uh, in this case, if you were the MGD light guy um, and you wanted to make your own Pokemon drink drinking game, you could definitely try to go to Nintendo and say, hey, can I have a license? And you can, um, and so you can send your email off. You can, you can hope for it. Um, and what, what you're gonna, <laughs> not, not a real email that probably would never have worked. Um, Yep, so that, what I was gonna point out is what I did do is say exactly what I was going to use it for. I want it for my own purpose, I wanna do one print, I'm not gonna sell it, yep. I am going to narrowly do this for my own good. Now, Pokemon drinking game probably doesn't meet their community threshold and what they would support in doing, okay. but you could always ask, and there, there's no harm in asking, um, and if you do get the permission, if they're, they're cool with it and they send it back and you include that email with your uh, order and Heather doesn't bother you about it, it's... They might uh, email you back from an undescript uh, Gmail email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in any case, uh, there's always that. Most places with significant IP rights and properties, they have a licensing department and they, you, can just, you can literally reach out and contact them. They might also have some form of public non-commercial license that you can use and they'll give you permission to do a commercial print, something like that uh, for your own for your own purposes. So this all begs the question though, why do we even need permission at all? And why is there any of this concern at all? And this is the IP crash course part of the presentation. And if you guys are all still awake at eight, whatever, 820 uh, after dinner, um, I will explain to you why people care and why it matters that we get permission and why Permission is probably the best possible path if you plan to do much of anything with your uh, fan-made game. The first point is that most, in, most uh, of the fan-made either writings, games, uh, fan fiction is based on some copyrighted work. And a copyrighted work gives an owner a set of exclusive rights that only they can exploit. It's, it's an exclusive set of rights to an original work of authorship, and this comes right out of the Constitution. So we have a copyright statute that's based in the United States Constitution, and this is why we have to worry about these things, because in those exclusive rights includes things like the ability to reproduce a work, 
to prepare derivative works, which is really important here, and to distribute copies of the work. So the thing that most, most fan fiction and most fan-made games run into is it's a derivative work of some other creative, creative work. And <clears throat> the risk is if you create a fan creative work, you try to do something like go to the Game Crafter and print it, or try to turn around and kickstart it, or try to sell it, or try to monetize it, even just trying to put it on your own website for other people to use, in theory, you risk a copyright infringement or a cease and desist letter from a publisher for the unauthorized derivative work, unauthorized creation of um, a copy of some aspect of the, the, uh, the copyrighted work. Um, and that's an infringement. So then the question becomes, well, what of these great things, these universes, these you know, properties are actually the subject matter of a work of authorship? What are the things that a copyright would attach to? And the general answer is it's pretty much anything that's drawn, written, videoed. If you can do something creative, if it's a creative element of any kind of work, there's some, some sort of copyright attached to it. Um, if you want explanation on public domain and other exceptions to the copyright rules, that's last year's or the year before his presentation. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the exceptions of what it is, but it's basically anything that you create. So the big exception that I will talk about, and it's interesting because it comes up in the public licenses for 5e, is copyrights don't extend to things like just the process or procedures or systems or methods, which is important if you're creating uh, um, a reskin of a game of, of, that you want to use. But it does capture graphics, it covers you know, uh, actual written text, it covers pictures and imagery. <clears throat> and probably the most important thing for fan-made games is the idea that a derivative work, a work based upon a pre-existing work, is an exclusive right of the copyright holder is really important for a fan hate game. Because in essence, it's the thing that lets Marvel create Marvel board games or movies. Their right, their exclusive right to the Marvel properties gives them the rights to those derivative regimes, which sort of coincides with what most people think of when they want to create their own deck building game or their own worker placement game based on those same universes. And if you create a derivative work and you try to release it, your risk is a copyright infringement. <clears throat> the, um, the statutes help, hopefully explain that there's a non-exhaustive list of types of um, uh, derivative works, like things like translations and musical arrangements, dramatizations, fictionalizations. You can throw in there gamifications, um, sound recordings, things like that. <laughs> But not everything is treated the same way under the copyright regimes. And I've created this little heat map for people to understand that when we look at the world of all of the things that might fit into a universe or a, an IP or uh, you know, into a, a writing or a movie that you might want to use into a game or something like that, there is different levels of protection. So, at the top are the things that are the core of copyright. Things like artwork, things like creative writing, the actual iconography of board games, stylized words and logos, the graphic design. Those are all things that are protected highly and at the center of, of uh, copyright. Um, it goes down a little bit and says things like distinctive characters. Typically, you don't get a copyright for like little clips and phrases out of a book, a secondary character tertiary element of a story, like those don't rise to the level of independent copyright protection, but distinctive characters, distinctive places uh, definitely do. It's hard to read on the screen, but the, uh, the, the citation here is to a case that says that not every character is entitled to copy pro copyright protection. Copyright protection is available only for characters that are specifically distinctive. So this is the Han Solos of the world. This is maybe not uh, just the, the, the red shirt on a Star Trek that doesn't have any particular characteristics associated with them other, other than dying constantly. Um, the, other, the other things that sort of, as we move down, written rules, 
Uh, if you're, if you're going to make a reskin of a game and you're copying verbatim the rules, you're, you're probably in the uh, copyright protection. But as you move further down, things like forms and sheets and tools, the amount of protection there is, gets smaller and smaller. There's, for example, I'll just pick on Yahtzee again for a second. There are lots of Yahtzee forms and remakes of the, the Yahtzee forms. And while they try really hard to protect the very specific Yahtzee forms, there is not a lot of copyright protection over creating forms and accounting spreadsheets. And we can thank the accountants and tax lawyers for that one because they use the same forms over and over and there's not a lot of copyright protections. As you start to move down, there's almost no protection for things like general structures and outlines and commonplace motifs and stories. So like the dark alley for a murder mystery game. It doesn't matter what you, did, you pick. A dark alley is a dark alley. Lots of people use that motif. Settings, scenes. Um, styles of play, like there's no copyright protection or anything that would stop you from creating another deck builder game or worker placement or area control. And then at the very bottom are things like facts and numbers and processes and procedures. So like you can create as many trivia games as you want based on the actual facts, even if they're made up in, you know, fictional facts, uh, as crazy as that sounds. Um, <clears throat> and so, then the question becomes, all right, if I'm creating a fan-made work, where are the real risks to, uh, hold your question, well, let me get through this one real quick and I'll get to your question. So then the, the question becomes, if you're creating a fan-made work and I've given you this heat map of the types of things that increase or decrease your risk if you're using those elements, where is the real risk? It's if you're using the copyright, the, those things that are at the core of the intellectual property rights, the copyrights, if you're using the art and the icons and the graphics and the imagery, if you're using the main characters and the stories and the storylines, the very specific backstories, the very expression of uh, the Harry Potter universe, those things that are in there, maybe even the spells or the way that the spells work out. Um, those are the types of elements that uh, are the riskiest and are most likely to draw fire. As you move down the heat map, you know, drawing inspiration from the Harry Potter universe and creating a school of wizards and, you know, that separate the boys and the girls and crazy little towers, like, you're okay with that. Good example, I'm gonna pick on JT again. The Captain is Dead is a classic example of creating a game that looks an awful lot like Star Trek. <laughs> including a thing that looks an awful lot like a, <laughs> the, uh, the Enterprise. But it's drawing on inspiration, it's drawing on themes, it's drawing on uh, you know, general purpose stuff, but it's not taking directly Jean-Luc Picard and sticking him smack dab in the middle of the game and saying he died and now uh, the crew has to figure out what to do with the ship. Um, I trust Riker. <laughs> the real problem for most fan-made games, though, is you're in the upper quadrant here. Like you want, you want to be able to use those things. And that is what draws the ire of publishers. That is what draws the ire of intellectual property lawyers looking at fan-made games going, can we really permit them to do this? And this is what gets you in the place and position of not being able to print games at the Game Crafter. So did you have a question then? Yeah, so the more, well, let me put it this way. The more specific something is, the higher up it goes. So like if you're just, you're talking about the literal Star Trek Enterprise, you know, and you're, you're calling it the Enterprise Bridge, and you're describing it in the details that Next Generation has used, and you're using the same imagery, like the more and more specific you get. The idea of a Starship Bridge as a place and a, lo as a, like general scene is fine. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. But if you're saying, I'm on the Enterprise, I'm in the captain's chair, which is center of a circular bridge with a big giant screen that, you know, like then you're starting to get closer and closer. But again, um, if, I'm, if I'm thinking about this, there's ways to even do that and still be okay. So it's really about the nature of the, what you're taking. So if you're taking Mordor, as the location and you're using it as Mordor, you're probably running closer to the 
uh, higher levels of protection and much more likely to run the risk of drawing a cease and desist if you use it in a way that um, isn't okay. Are we good? <laughs> that is a different issue. We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> it's true. Yes. Look, I, I, it's even up here. All right. So, um, all right. All of this said, this, you might be wondering, well, then how do people do it? Or how is it that, uh, you know, SNL can do, you know, mock whatever versions of Star Trek and everybody knows it's Star Trek or it doesn't matter. There is a concept baked into the ideas of copyright and it's fundamental to the way our copyright system works. It's called fair use. Parody is one example of that. Um, the whole idea here is, look, copyright regime was set up in order to promote the progress, promote the arts, uh, advance it. It is not meant to hinder people from being able to do creative, new, sometimes transformative, sometimes commentary related uh, uses of intellectual property. That's fundamentally contrary to the constitutional purpose of the copyright regime. The Supreme Court uh, in a famous case involving uh, no, no other than Two Live Crew, um, <laughs> Two Live Crew had a song made fun of uh, Pretty Woman. This was a Supreme Court case. Let's just say that basically the way that the Supreme Court came down is it, it said, just because they used Pretty Woman doesn't mean that it's an infringement. And you don't necessarily get, an, you can't necessarily enjoin, stop somebody from creating a work simply because it looks like an infringement if there is another purpose for it. So, Parody, there's a, that's the common one people point to when they're thinking about fair use. But for most fan-made games, parody is probably not the place that you're going to end up. <clears throat> because what ends up happening is the way fair use works out is the courts do this four-part test. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. Again, I think I did this last year. Um, but they look at the purpose and the character of the infringement of the work of the secondary work. They look at the nature. On the, of the use of that work, they look at the amount taken, and they look at the effect upon the original work. And they sort of do this balancing test and ask the question, do we want this sort of thing to happen or don't we? And they do this weird balancing, there's no magic formula I can give you to tell you which way the courts will come out. But what I will tell you is that there are, there is one very recent Supreme Court case uh, I think it was just last year, that Google won in which the court looked at uh, a fair use analysis in a commercial product where they made a transformative use of Oracle's Java code, which they found is not infringing, even though they took a substantial amount of the Java implementing code and created their own Android operating system. The Supreme Court's like, yeah, that was different. It was transformative. It gave right, it, it is doing what the, uh, what the Constitution wants us to do. It enabled Google to uh, advance uh, a different purpose that the underlying Java code by itself did not. The other case, I think was argued just last month, was a case in which the photographer took the picture on the left, Andy Warhol made the paintings on the right, the paintings on the right were licensed to magazine covers and the photographer didn't get any money from this. And she sued the estate of Andy Warhol for um, those two cases, uh, for, the, for the magazine's use of it. Needless to say, that case is up at the Supreme Court. I can't tell you how it's gonna come out, but the underlying courts have gone both directions on whether this sort of use was transformative, which again, from a game designer's perspective and you're looking at fan-made games, and if Andy Warhol can get away with using that picture in that way, there might be a good argument to say your games are transformative and may not be an infringement. Which actually brings me to the non-commercial point in the Google case, because Google made, Android makes Google tons of money. Android is not a non-commercial activity for Google. They took Java's 
code, they implemented it in something that they sold, and nevertheless, the Supreme Court looked at it and said, yeah, still fair use, that's exactly what's supposed to happen. Um, yeah, it's normally true that non-commercial uses tend to favor the accused infringer, but it's not definitive. You might be able to get away with a fan-made game that's transformative. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it, as long as it's transformative, as long as you've done something creative and new and different, and I cannot give you, I cannot stress enough for you right now though, I don't know where that line is. I don't know what transformative is, but the courts have tended to go in the direction of if you can do something truly transformative with it, you might be outside the scope of uh, copyright infringement. They ignore the fact that you stole some of the they, they straight up acknowledge that. Yeah. They, they, they looked at hundreds of thousands of lines of implementing code, yeah. said it didn't matter. So <laughs> you, can, you can debate me all you want. I can't, tell, I can't overrule the Supreme Court. Um, I am just telling you that there is, an, there is an opportunity for game designers, if you're doing something truly transformative with an intellectual property that doesn't necessarily displace the IP right owner's sort of original market, like you might have an opportunity to design a game and do something more, more than just a hobby um, out of it. This leads into the next set of questions, which gets to your confusion point. Um, copyright's not the only thing people run into. And in fact, I know I've been asked questions about um, the way people label games and name games that are fan-made expansions or components or component upgrades. Uh, and this runs into two other areas of law. One is trademark law. <clears throat> so, a trademark is basically anything that identifies to a consumer the source of a good. This, in most people think about it, it's a word. It's, you know, it's Ford, it's Hasbro, it's Mattel. You know these are companies. If you see their logo on a product, you assume that that product is from those companies. You assume that the Ford car is from Ford and not from uh, a Chinese knockoff. There are tons and tons of examples in the board game world. I picked a handful of things for two purposes. One, to show you how an original trademark, for example, I'm just gonna pick on Gloomhaven because I used it earlier. Uh, Gloomhaven has a base game. Gloomhaven also has a smaller subset. They have Gloomhaven and Jaws of the Lion. Wingspan has a whole series of expansions that are Wingspan expansions. Um, these are the way trademark owners use their own marks to signify their own products and their own goods. When you are making your own fan-made game, it is good to keep in mind that a trademark owner has trademark rights and has its own separate related sets of legal obligations to protecting and policing it. So you do not want to be in a category where you look like your fan-made game is an is an official expansion or related in any way to the underlying games. Um, and there's a whole bunch of ways that uh, people might associate the, the mark. I, I, there's a whole bunch up here. I'll pick on role player for a second. It's actually interesting the way Keith has done role player because he's got role player, he's got role player adventure, kept the, the gold logo with the blue outline and then added adventures. He's got cartographers, a role player tale, which is interesting when we get to it in a second, but it's got the same you know, gold lettering, same font style. Uh, you've got Haba over there with yellow boxes and box designs that are, you know instantly when you see a game shelf full of yellow boxes, they're almost all Haba games. I don't think anybody else has a bright yellow box like that. Um, uh, those are all ways and all signifiers of the actual owners of the trademarks, the original creators of the games, the publishers, the the licensees or licensors of the game. Um, oh yeah, there's my picture of a whole wall of Hoppa games, not mine. <clears throat> it is an infringement of a trademark right to use someone's trademark in a way that is likely to cause confusion for a consumer. So you have to look at the world in the trademark space through the eyes of consumer. If you looked at a, in a your game and the way you've named your game, the way you've illustrated it, the way you've designed it, the way it looks and feels and 
if you were a consumer and you thought it belonged to the original creators, you're probably, you're probably stepping on some sort of trademark right, whether it's the game name or the logo, uh, could be look and feel, could be overall appearance, all of those things are signifiers. <clears throat> so, like I did for the copyright section above, I have a handful of do's and don'ts that, again, if you're gonna take a picture of something or you know, steal a slide, if you're naming your fan-made game, these are pretty good um, ways to think about the world. You, you do wanna do things to differentiate your unofficial, unsanctioned, unlicensed version of whatever game it is from the original. If you're creating a, a deluxified version of components for a game, don't put the game's name as the biggest possible thing up there and make it look like it came from uh, you know, the actual publishers. That's, you gotta do something else. You gotta indicate it's unofficial. You gotta do something. <clears throat> um, that's the, actually the second point, which is identify the nature of the product that you're selling. Is this official? Is this unofficial? Do something to differentiate yourself from an actual licensed um, game. Make it your own. Like, okay, it's a risk expansion, but call it, uh, I don't remember what the game was at the beginning, like domain or something, a risk expansion and make it very small. You know, but the, the game itself, the game name is its own thing. There's no way anybody looking at that would necessarily associate it with um, the original publishers other than the fact that you could um, play it with it. <clears throat> If you're going to use the original game's name, then use it in a way that names it only. Uh, you know, it's uh, Mike's deluxified version of role player. Like that, you know, you're using it only as a name and only as a way to identify that, that's, that this expansion or this deluxification belongs with that game. You're not using it as role player deluxified. Um, don't use the logo. I don't know how many times I have to tell people the logos are themselves copyrights. <laughs> like, if it's a if it's a pretty graphic design, not just text word name, don't use the logo. Um, don't make the their name more prominent than yours. Don't make risk the giant words that people see. That's that's um, going to cause confusion. Um, avoid distinctive colors. So like a hop of yellows. <clears throat> The, the question often then becomes, is there a fair use defense to uh, trademark infringement? Actually, my favorite case ever is because the New Kids on the Block. Um, uh, again, Supreme Court case, New Kids on the Block. Um, this basically said that, look, you can use New Kids on the Block if you're identifying New Kids of the Block as the subject, not as the actual name of something. So it was a raffle for New Kids on the Block tickets. Fine, New Kids on the Block, is the name, you don't have to say that band with five guys from whatever, like you don't have to go through that non-descriptiveness. Um, this is actually also built out into the statute, the same idea that if you're not using it in a trademark way, nobody cares, it's a fair use of a name. Uh, uh, the Super Bowl stuff always gets me because when people say like, we're having a Super Bowl party and then everybody hears, you have to call it the big game. And then, that's not exactly the way it works, but. Um, Nevertheless, you can use it as the actual name, an expansion for role player, things like that. Uh, which is actually why the cartographer is a role player adventure, or a role player something cracks me up because it's exactly what I tell people to do and they did it with their own IP. Um, <laughs> they might not have to, but they, they did it for other reasons. Um, the other thing that sometimes people run into when they're creating fan-made games of especially movie properties or Harry Potter, or, you know, Star Wars, is you run into rights of publicity, <coughs> publicity problem. People have the right to control their own image, their own likeness, their own names. Um, and what that means is if you want to put like a picture of Han Solo on your card, not only do you probably have a copyright issue, but you might have a Harrison Ford issue, right? Like he has the, um, he's got the blaster, uh, you can't use his likeness in your game and not expect to draw a, at least a little bit of trouble. This comes up in photos. It even comes up in photos of just random people on the street. You could have the same rights of publicity problems even if it's not a famous person. Um, same thing goes for illustrations and likenesses of people. So just because you 
can put Harrison Ford with Blaster Gun into mid-journey AI and come up with an illustration doesn't mean I could use this in a video game without running into the same sorts of um, uh, rights of publicity issues. The same is technically true. There's a commentary, pop parody. Yeah, that's what we get a lot of um, specific people. <laughs> just like, I, I could imagine. Um, I'm not your lawyer. I don't. Depending on what the game is like, you should probably just cancel. Yeah, so, right. There are other exceptions to the rights of publicity. There's definitely commentary, news, parody rights that you could have that might still apply. Um, but this is a particularly tricky one. It varies from state to state. It varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The best answer is, unless you got specific permission or uh, an actor's release or whatever, you should probably just not use it at all. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna quick cover reskinning real quickly because Almost everything that we've talked about now sort of assumes that you're gonna create a game that isn't like another game. You're making your own, designing your own, you're doing your own thing. But as I pointed out, like I, I created, helped create a deck of cards that you could play with um, uh, the game. The game has a very simple set of rules. It didn't take much to, to write them down. But the idea here with reskinning is you could create your own version of a game and not run into many intellectual property issues because copyright does not protect things like the game systems, the ideas, the functions, the, those specific elements. They might not even cover the clips and phrases that you find on specialized cards used in the game. What it may protect is the entirety of it. So you gotta be careful about where you run into that. So the particular expression of, you know, this deck of Pokemon cards has all of these powers and all of these features and if you just wanted to take every single Pokemon card in uh, a generation and recreate them, you're probably gonna run into a different copyright issue. Um, but it's still pretty limited. You could create a Pokemon set of games and cards and things like that and use the gameplay and mechanics and probably even the values and some of the, the powers and not run into those um, same issues. Um, reskinning again, like trademarks still protect the name, so if like, you're gonna reskin a game and you're gonna call it a reskinning of something else, uh, you, you're, you may run into that problem. The interesting thing about my version is the game that I reskinned was called The Game, so I don't think there's much trademark protection, so I think I was in the clear. Um, the Game is not a very good trademark. Do not name your game The Game. That is just the dumbest, dumbest thing. Um, <laughs> or a terrible SEO. Um, so in any case, uh, this is all true. One gigantic footnote about, you know, if there is a patent out there, there's not that many game patents. Um, most of them are well known and sort of well publicized and well thought of, but um, there's not that many patents. But if a patent does cover a game mechanic that is special or unique, um, uh, you do run the risk of patent infringement if you try to reskin a game just because of that. Um, I think we got a... Um, Well, I could have said Heather at thegamecrafter.com. That would be better. All right. Yeah, I like so. <laughs> I actually need help from Delta. Now you're going to clog up the field. <laughs> um, I think there's time for questions. I don't know where we are at. Um, yeah. There might be a, so. Is it a review board or maybe it's not an official court system? So patents, so everything patents. Not and, patents. Okay, not so patents has its own, th yeah, like. Not um, copyright trademark. Not that I'm aware of. It wouldn't surprise me if there were special procedures for things like, um, especially online takedowns, that there are definitely individual procedures for that under the digital millennial. Copyright Act, but um, I don't know. Maybe I've not heard of that. So I know that in companies you have to protect their trademarks. Is that the same for copyright? 
Yeah, okay, so the, so the question is, um, is there the same obligation on a copyright owner to protect and enforce their copyrights? Like there is the rule in trademarks. So trademarks, you only get your trademark because it's distinctive. Consumers know to look to you as the trademark holder for that intellectual property. If you don't enforce it and everybody starts using, uh, I'll just, uh, elevators or escalators as the name of the same type of good or service, then you start to lose your trademark rights. And so what trademark owners typically do is have to enforce their trademark rights against people who try to misuse their trademarks to pass off as the same product names. That rule doesn't really apply in copyright. There's no requirement that you sue or go after or tell everybody that's misusing your copyright or using your copyright in a way that you don't agree with that they have to stop. The problem is if you're really lax on it and you're letting an infringer get away with infringement over a long period of time, potentially the period of time in which you have the right to enforce it, your, that infringement risk might have gone away. You, that uh, statute of limitations might have run on that particular set of infringement. There, but there's not really uh, uh, a rule that says somebody who continues to sell my product after seven years, I can't go after them for the most recent set of infringements. There's no, there's no like so sitting on your know, rights issue. Could, could we the Supreme Court have used the Supreme Intellectual Property Rule of 2022? Use legislation or court procedures for intellectual property disputes? So what they, so what courts will do a lot of frequently is figure out ways to fast track or expedite very common and tedious sets of, okay. sets of like discovery or procedures or, oh, are we really gonna dispute ownership of the copyright Maybe we'll advance the way, uh, advance away more quickly for the copyright owner to demonstrate they are in fact the owner without requiring three years of litigation to oh prove ownership. <laughs> well, it could take a while. I mean, a lot of copyright cases can take a while. There's discovery. Um, I, I kind of blew past it, but as a copyright owner, to prove infringement, you have to prove that you own it, that the, it's an original work of authorship that they had access to the copyrighted works that they, they took and stole. There's a whole bunch of elements of it. Do you advocate, because I know you can file copyright for, for 50 bucks or something yourself. Do you advocate that as a way to protect in these kind of copyright cases? Or? Uh, so, so this is turning the question. Sorry. No, no, it's, it's fine. <laughs> this is turning the, uh, the situation around, right? Yeah. So if you are the original creator and actually, we could talk about whether you have copyrights in your own fan-made game and your own creative expression, which you totally do. Um, whether you wanna go file a copyright registration over your creation, eh, I don't know. But um, <laughs> if you are the copyright holder, you get copyright rights automatically the moment you set pen to paper, the moment you, you know, print your ink to playing card, uh, the, the moment that it's actually fixed in a tangible medium that's saved to your hard drive. Um, not just me talking at you, the, um, but the moment it's recorded there, then it magically becomes copyrighted. Um, you don't have to file a registration. It's recommended if you think you're gonna have to enforce it because it lets you get statutory damages, it lets you show up in federal court um, without having to do that stuff later. So oh, thanks. it's kind of depending on what you're doing. Yes? So earlier we were talking about take someone else's IP, make a game of it, and then send it to the game crafter. And if they print it, like, I know you guys are gonna cap capture this, I'm not gonna do it. But let's say they did, and then the original IP people find out. Who's gonna get in trouble? They're gonna contact you. You're probably gonna get in trouble. I'm gonna get in trouble? What, they what, what they, <laughs> what they, they may very well send a cease and desist letter to the game. And what, what will likely happen is if they end up, is if the game crafter continues to print it, if they continue to have a series of violations, then they're gonna end up in trouble. That's actually, there's like, during the 80s or 90s, there's like a whole line of copy shop cases where that was literally what ha ended up happening. They'd send a cease and desist letter to some copy shop who was making copies of coursework for colleges and you know the copyright owners, the, book, the textbook manufacturers realized that that was going on send it to the copy shops, the copy shops are like, oh yeah, okay, fine, well, we're still gonna do this because we're making a bunch of money. They end up getting sued for copyright infringement. In theory, probably the professors who are asking to copy these articles and put them out should be there, but 
you know, professors at the time, whatever, they didn't make that much money. The copy shops ended up on the hook for a bunch of those cases. Uh, that's going to be the case here too. You're going to end up as the ultimate like infringer of first right. You're going to get that letter. You're going to stop doing it because you don't have the resources or wherewithal to, to fight them uh, on it. You're also violating our terms of service by submitting that. We'll just send JT to your house. <laughs> uh, yeah, like it's scary. To clean up after JT. There's not enough crafter points. <laughs> <laughs> That's typical. That does not surprise me either. <laughs> Silence is not consent. Um, uh, no, that's a, it's a good point. Very often, lots of these places, especially if you want a very popular IP, you're not gonna, you're, you're probably going to be put into a very long queue. There's, you know, like, um, the fantastic things are like when people wanna do Harry Potter events and they send their request to run a Harry Potter themed public event to, um, uh, Warner Brothers and Warner Brothers is like, nah, I'm just not even going to respond. They don't have the right to do it. And then you end up with news stories about local Harry Potter festival shut down by cease and desist letter. It's like, it's because they, they, they just moved on. Um, silence is not that, so. So it's a good question. Um, the consequence of a copyright infringement is damages, and they're often called statutory damages to the tune of lots and lots of money per infringement. Um, there would be a damages phase at trial, which they would prove how much the, the photographer lost as a result of not being part of the licensing deal. They'd probably disgorge their profits. Um, you know, in some cases, uh, I'll, we can go to the counterfeiting, for example. One of the consequences of counterfeiting and copyright infringement cases like that is destruction of the, the copy, the unauthorized copies. There's a whole bunch of co potential consequences um, for an infringement. For a fan-made game, the consequence is you're just going to stop and you're going <laughs> to delete your files and you're going to move on with your life. So nobody's going to sue you for infringement unless you start trying to sell it. I think I'm up on time and I see Seth is ready and roaring. Will you, will you make a transformative version of Monopoly with me? Oh, God. <laughs> with Pokemon characters? It's going to be transformative. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. We're going to break the, you're going to have to set the too. We're going to break the gray threshold of being sued and it'll be transformative. And you, there could be a the Game Crafter case, the Mattel. Nope. <laughs> be great. It's like every company's dream is to have like a Supreme Court case, right? No. Oh, okay. Hey, good, good publicity. Right? <laughs> Something Thanks, like Mike. that. Appreciate it.